Drew D. Orman, I hope you're doing well, man. Welcome into the game in T-Town. Uh, welcome, uh, Ryan. I appreciate that. I always enjoy being on in the city of Champions in Tuscaloosa. I know you guys have uh, been going through some things after uh, a weather mishap uh, with the station this past Friday. I understand that. And uh, never easy, but uh, always find a way to get on the air for the uh, great uh, listeners that you have in your area. Hey, no doubt. We appreciate it. And in, in, in the bolt of lightning, it's kind of hard to deflect that a little bit. It, it's a uh, – <laughs> we're, we're, we're thinking – we're, we're, we're thinking that uh, God may be an Auburn fan. I, I just well, I don't know if that's true, but you know they always talk about the orange and blue skies. We're, we're something about that lightning bolt. It, it could have been an Auburn guy that was in charge of that. Well, yeah, I ran into that issue at Dairy Queen. We uh, talked about that last week, but uh, certainly uh, maybe uh, it was uh, uh, the uh, Kirby Smart trying to get some revenge uh, following the bolt of lightning that cost him a national championship and. Uh, made uh, Herschel Walker continue to be as relevant as he is on that campus. And, and those Herschel Walker DVDs, as you always like to say, right? Or is it, exactly. or is it VHS tapes? Is what, Which one is it, DVDs or VHS tapes? Uh, they converted them to, you know, DVDs years ago. Okay, so. good, good. Well, I'm, I hope they're enjoying you, you think about a rough off season, man, because they were celebrating at halftime. And we'll get to Terrell, Terrell Lewis, but could you imagine Georgia fans? We were talking with Derek Lassick last week. And Derek Lassick told us, he said, man, I had Georgia fans call to me because he lives in that state halftime. They were already claiming the victory. He said, just wait, just wait, just wait. Something's going to happen big. Well, sure it did, right? I mean, it did. And and Alabama was able to go back in, in a victory. And But, you know, you, you don't count your what, chickens before your eggs hatch or whatever that old old saying is. Yeah, you don't, you know, you never get too far ahead. Uh, it's very tough to win an national championship. I mean, it's something I know Alabama has won five in nine years. But don't ever take it for granted. I mean, it's the greatest run in history, and certainly uh, that was a uh, you know uh, an unbelievable half Alabama played. And Terrell Lewis made one of the biggest defensive plays we saw as they got the big sack to force the field goal for Georgia. But unfortunately, you know he he's had just about the worst injury luck you could fathom. I mean, last year uh, with the elbow injury that kept him out the majority of the season, and now we see this with the non-contact ACL. Uh, during workouts last year. I mean, excuse me, last week, pardon me. Uh, but uh, you really have to feel for that young man. It's got to be really tough mentally uh, to, to uh, have su- suffer this kind of setback again. He's, you know, one of probably the top five most talented guys on the team, certainly has first-round talent. We have not seen a, a lot of it, though. I mean, uh, I think everyone was expecting him to break out this year. He had a great spring, but it's just one of those things. It's uh, just kind of the uh, – the, uh, the fate of the injury, and just sometimes, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's it's just like what happened at the at your radio station with the strike of the bolt of light. You just can't, uh, you know, uh, you can't help it. You know, it happening. You just have to keep working. And certainly, thoughts and prayers are out to Terrell and his family. But it's kind of interesting because he played some as a freshman, and we could see the athletic talent, uh, but only in glimpses. And then we really haven't seen him a lot, you know, in the last year, except for you know, uh, in the first game against. Uh, FSU made a couple of plays, and then what he did from the Auburn game on, and especially in the college football playoff when he was able to get even healthier. But I know there's already people, you know, speculating about his return. But see, this is different to me. When you injure a knee, it has to do with your mobility. It's not an elbow injury, and I think this will be a tougher deal. I think it's a four to six month recovery. He's probably going to end up redshirting and missing the year, and coming back as a as a redshirt junior. Uh, but uh, hopefully he can just get healthy and uh, they'll, and they'll finally uh, will allow him to showcase his talent because I think we've only seen him scratch the surface and he can certainly be a dominant force. But luckily for Alabama, they have a lot of depth and outside linebacker. And, uh, but I will say this team is not as deep as it was a year ago in the in, inside and outside. They can't afford another rash of injuries. They're going to have to have some injury luck and certainly – uh, already uh, with a tough situation before uh, you know fall camp has even started. We're talking to Drew DeArmond. We're talking about Terrell Lewis, Dick Saban, confirming that the ACL was in training, and I think it just really helps you understand this is not a a common training injury. You know, you, you could you could tear an ACL in a lot of different ways. I mean, you, you could go out and trip and all this rainy, wet conditions that we're having here in West Alabama. We're not complaining because it, it does help us quite a bit. But when you go back to – when you talk about the injury to Trell Lewis, the impact is so much 
You could talk about the defensive backs, and I think it's huge for these guys. You need a guy that can get after the quarterback. Terrell Lewis was going to be that guy. I mean, Drew, can you think of another guy that was going to – Christian Miller, maybe. I thought those two guys were probably going to be the co-leaders in sacks. Is is that fair? I mean, Terrell Lewis was probably going to be your sack leader, if not your co-sack leader with Christian Miller. Well, I think those two guys are the two you look toward. But don't forget, Raekwon had eight and a half sacks last You're year. Right. Certainly can uh, rush the passer uh, from that defensive line. And I think, uh, you know, overall, Anthony Jennings, he had the best game of his career against Clemson before getting injured. He was starting to show some pass rush potential. Certainly, I don't know if he's as dynamic and as long as Terrell Lewis, but I think he uh, he brings a lot to the table and with his intangibles. Uh, you know, what it also kind of hurts Alabama is versat- versatility because with the dismissal of Vandarius Cowan yesterday, and, and we've talked about Vandarius and ad nauseum, no one was surprised uh, that Cowan was ultimately dismissed from the program. Certainly had a uh, talent to be a great player, uh, but uh, it's all about the mental side. Didn't make enough good decisions off the field, both academically and with his behavior, so he's no longer with the program. Because a lot of people have speculated that maybe Chris Allen and Christian Miller might see some time inside. Now with Terrell Lewis being gone, I think that lessens that likelihood. And, of course, it made me wonder, would Keith Holcomb play now because of the baseball situation? It sounds doubtful. It sounds like Keith Holcomb's going to move on and, and concentrate on a baseball career. So it just means that guys are like uh, Jalen Moody, who was signed at the last minute last year from South Carolina, uh, is going to be counted on to provide depth this year because they brought him in because of Cowan's tenuous situation. Uh, then you've also got Joshua McMillan, who to this point has been a guy that has not played a lot but should be uh, want somebody that's experienced that they should be able to count on to play inside. And, and then, of course, uh, Markel Benton. Benton had, I thought, a really fine spring. Uh, he's a redshirt freshman. He should be earning the trust of the coaching staff. So, But I will say, and I tweeted this out earlier this afternoon, Ryan, what this means, even in this, as far as with a, for the linebacker core as a whole, they cannot afford to lose Mac Wilson or Dylan Moses for any period of time because they don't have the depth they had a year ago inside, and now they have one less outside linebacker to provide them with some versatility. So they've got to keep some of these core guys healthy, such as Dylan Moses, Mac Wilson, Christian Miller, who missed most of last year, and Anthony Jennings. It's crucial to keep those guys healthy and on the field because Alabama just doesn't have the depth they had a year ago. You know, when you spend a lot of time talking about linebackers, I always go back to the performance against Clemson. Anthony Jennings, if he could take that success that he put up against Clemson in New Orleans and continue that in 2018, I mean, this is going to be a great year for him if he can get back to that coming off of the injury. No, no question. I mean, it was the best game of his career. It's just sad that he got hurt uh, toward the you know the latter part of it and missed the national championship game. And that's the thing that a lot of people don't talk about, is he wasn't on the field against uh, Kirby Freeze. I mean, smart, uh, to help him uh, win that game. He would have been a big factor because he's a guy that can play every down. He's really good against the run, setting the edge. He's also, uh, you know, as we said, developing as a pass rusher. He certainly was a thorn in the side of Clemson. So I think Anthony Jennings' best football is still ahead of him. I think he's going to step up as a leader this year, and uh, certainly you hope he can stay healthy. But, uh, you know, now uh, it just it heightens it because uh, Yabi Anoma is a guy, Ryan, we've talked about him at nauseum, uh, from the St. Francis Academy in Baltimore, Maryland. Thought he was the best pass rusher in the country. Last two years had over 50 sacks combined. He's come in. He did not enroll early, but certainly – they're going to need to develop a role for him on third down. I think he can rush the passer. Also, a guy that went through the spring that gray shirted, uh, you know, Jerez Parks from uh, the state of Florida. And I think he impressed him some with his length and pass rush ability, too. I think those two guys, you're going to have to develop a role for them. They're not going to be, you know, every down players, but certainly I think you're going to have to use them as pass rushers going forward. And they're going to have to provide you depth uh, for the rest of the season. No question about that. Drew DeArmond, let me ask you this question here when we talk about uh, the offense. How much pressure does that put on the the Crimson Tide when we talk about offensive side of the football? Well, I mean, they, they're going to have to score points, right? I mean, we all knew the defensive way they were going to have probably some growing pains, especially I think, the you know, I was just answering this question on Twitter earlier about the secondary. 
uh, and they were talking about the, how huge the loss of Terrell Lewis was because there's not an experienced secondary back, and, and that is true, but I do think the secondary will be fine long term. I think it's actually more talented. Probably with these, with these young guys and what you're hearing are true. I think it's going to be a deeper secondary, uh, but certainly it will be inexperienced. Uh, but uh, I do think uh, that, the, that the defense will get better uh, and I think make big strides by midseason and then uh, toward the end of the year. But they, Alabama certainly, more than any other year, needs to come out and be sharp offensively and efficient and score points. I mean, I do understand that the schedule is a little bit uh, easier for Alabama and uh, everyone's kind of already uh, – <laughs> Uh, you know, uh, uh, already got a blowout going for the Louisville Cardinals, and more than likely it should be a one-sided contest in Orlando. Uh, but certainly uh, Alabama needs to come out and establish offensive identity and rhythm early. And the way you do that is, uh, I think, with Tua Tungvaluwa at quarterback. Uh, Alabama averaged you know, the mid-30s last year, but in so many ways they weren't very good in the red zone, uh, and they struggled to throw the football down the field. Uh, they didn't get the football to, you know, up, uh, several different guys. They didn't spread the football around. They need to do that. And they, this team uh, coming out, the identity of this team is going to have to be on offense. Because as you said, there's so much experience back. They should have plenty of talent on the offensive line and plenty of talent wide receiver, running back, tight end, so much depth. So th- with this with this group, uh, I think, and uh, with the, the new uh, regime, new coaching staff, you know, Josh Gaddis, I think he's an upgrade at wide receivers coach. I think, you know, uh, it's, it, it Mike Locksley will be fine at OC. And I think Dan Enos, there hasn't been enough made about what he can do with these quarterbacks. But I just think when you look at Tua Tungvaluwa, to me, he's the starting quarterback of this team. And if you can come out and, and gain a lot of confidence on offense, it will allow the defense to come along. Nick Saban's always going to be a defensive guy. They're always going to put uh, emphasis on that side of the ball. But this year – because of so much talent they've lost over the last two years and the injuries, they need to come out and uh, you know establish themselves on offense strong from day one. Well, and I, I don't think, I mean, Drew, as I look at this offense, I don't think there's any excuse. I mean, you've talked about it. I don't know if I'm, I'm out there with you. I think you talked about averaging uh, in the upper 40s. I, I'm trying to think exactly what you said, but you think it's going to be – I also agree that this is going to be explosive. There's just no excuse for this team to not just blow teams out offensively. Now, defensively, we're going to watch some growing pains, going to watch some inexperience develop, and I think by November, this will be a typical Nick Saban-style defense. There's a lot of talent, and but, but you look at offensively, I mean, help me justify why this offense should not be major productively. I mean, there's no way – there. you can't not, uh, you know, justify that. It, you know, it, it'll be, you know – the only way this offense will not reach its potential is if the quarterback position is not handled properly. Uh, and that would be that two is healthy and then two it comes out, performs like he's capable of performing, and, and wins this job. And I don't want to hear two-quarterback system because that's what they should have had last year once Tua got his feet wet enough and proved himself. It's not a two-quarterback system anymore. This is that they need to come out and uh, be, you know somebody needs to win the team, which I think has already happened in my opinion. And then you know they need to have one starting quarterback and one voice in that room leading this offense. And I think everyone saw who that is. I think it's Tua uh, with the energy he brought to the offense in that national championship game. You're never going to play on a bigger stage than he played then. So uh, now we want to see what he can do. You know with a with a uh, you know a full game under his belt starting from day one. Uh, I think it's extremely exciting. You know, hopefully, you know he's, he's going to uh, protect the football. I think that's the one, if, the, you know, uh, thing people go back to that they wonder. You know, if is he going to turn the football over? But I, you know, to me, I think the more he plays, the better he's going to get. And I mean, I think he's only scratched the surface, so it should excite everyone. And I, you know, and what I have said is, I, I say that they have the talent on this offense. I think to average fifty points per game. Do I think that's going to happen? Probably not. Because Nick Saban's not Steve Spurrier. He's not going to continue to try to score uh, when the game gets out of hand. Nick Saban's going to take air out of the ball. He's going to run the football. He's going to play a lot of guys. So, you know, he's going to, he, he is not going to run the score up on people. But certainly, I think this team can average in the 40s easily. Uh, I think, uh, you know, when you think about uh, the offensive line and the talent, and the, they even have depth on the O-line as well. When you think about the, the, the capability of Tua, the way he can throw the ball down the field, Alabama, even with A.J. McCarron, as great as he was, 
he was not a great deep ball thrower. You know, he a vertical guy. And I think uh, Tua Tagovailoa is going to bring that to this offense on a consistent basis. Did AJ make some throws down the field? Yes, but I'm talking about on a game in, game out, quarter in, quarter out basis. And I think Tua can make all the throws. And I think it's going to make this offense really hard to stop because. You know, if the, the old adage with Nick Saban was to load the box and stop the run and make the quarterback beat you. Well, if you do that now with Tua Tonga by roll behind center, he's going to make you pay. And I just think it's going to make the, it even easier to run the football. And I can't wait to see these four running backs get touches because they've got four high quality guys. that all deserve to play. Well, I think the partner, uh, you know, a guy that I know you've done a ton of work with and a guy that has been your radio partner on BAM's radio and, and different things and made the appearance. When you look back at, at the conversation, when you talk about William Barger, he got excited last week talking about the rushing attack and, and what that offense, uh, when we talk about the open rushing lanes that are going to be a part of it. Yeah, I mean, I don't think there's any doubt. I mean, because you're going to have to respect to his ability and his, uh, to make every throw in the playbook. Because Alabama was so limited, uh, they could not throw vertically. You know, they weren't, you know, they could not throw the ball down the field much at all. They weren't throwing the ball accurately. So you could kind of punch everything at the, at, at the uh, you know, at the, every, you could put eight, nine in the box with ease. Uh, you're not going to be able to do that with two, eight quarterbacks. So that should be very exciting. They should be able to run against boxes that aren't loaded. It's actually kind of amazing that they've run the football as well as they have the last few years, Brian, and averaging well over 200 yards per game without. Uh, you know, the benefit of a big-time passing game. It just makes you wonder what they can do. So, uh, I just think well, I mean, overall, they, offensively, they're going to really have to make uh, – I think that that's what's going to be the identity of this team is uh, being able to be balanced offensively and uh, really be tough for a defense that's kind of – they're going to have to pick their poison, so to speak. I mean, let's go back to Damien Harris. Let me read off his stats from last year. You ready for this? He had 125 – 135 carries, excuse me – 135 carries for 1,000 yards. We talk about net gain. He only lost eight yards. He had 11 touchdowns and averaged 7.4 yards every time he touched the football. Pretty amazing. Uh, no question. And uh, I think Najee Harris has only scratched the surface of what he could do. And then when you think about Josh Jacobs playing on one leg for you know two-thirds of the season, he had you know a broken leg for the most part, but toughed it out and uh, played. He had a fracture in his leg. And then you think about Brian Robinson and what we've seen out of him. Uh, I mean, I think the possibilities are endless. And to me, it, it all goes back to being able to distribute the football and uh, a guy to be able to you know, get uh, you know multiple guys involved. And that's that's too uh, because he, uh, he in one half and you get nine guys to touch the football. Everybody's happy. Everybody's energized. And that's been the biggest problem with when Jalen Hurts has been a quarterback. He certainly won games. He certainly protected the football. Never, you know, we've never had a problem with that. But uh, he's also dominated the football. He's been the leading ball carrier. He's also been a guy that uh, only one, two receivers touch the football consistently. And he, and, he, and even in those cases, a guy like Calvin Ridley wasn't, uh, you know, as involved as he should have been, even though he touched the football quite frequently. So I just think overall, when you talk about chemistry, you talk about a team playing up to their potential. Uh, when you see Tua Tungvaloa and the little bit he's accomplished, but what uh, it's I, you know it's overall he still hasn't you know he's only scratched the surface, but you just uh, to be you, you should you should believe that the possibilities are endless what he can do with this uh, wide receiver group. And we haven't even factored in we haven't even seen him practice, but certainly everything we've heard about Jalen Waddle this summer is very exciting, and you factor him into the mix with these top you know four wide receivers, including. Terrell Shavers, who was having a really good, you know, spring before he was injured toward the end. I mean, it's just uh, if you're an Alabama fan, it's, I think it's going to be the best offense of the Nick Saban era. Should everyone stay healthy, especially number thirteen behind center, Drew Armand, Let's talk a little SEC football for a couple of minutes. Uh, who do you? Well, what do you think outside of Alabama? Because you and I have talked about this for many, many years. When you see Alabama come rolling through the building you realize who is the king of the SEC. You realize that Gus is, you know, mumbling, stumbling Gus on Thursday. I, I bet he will not have at least half the audience that Nick Saban will have on Wednesday. For one, everybody's going to be gone because he's not, you know, it's, it's, it's like the opening act 
of the opening act. He's the closing act, and, and it's no, nobody's going to be there. Uh, there'll be half the people listening to Gus. I, I'll probably be back in Tuscaloosa because I don't want, I don't want to sit around and hear him. But what do you think is the big attention grabbing conversation? Maybe it's Jimbo Fisher and back in the, you know the SEC as a head coach now at Texas A and M. Anything that really grabs you that you're looking forward to hearing next next week at SEC Media Days? Well, I'm actually very intrigued in the first day with Ed Ogeron because, I mean, I think uh, he won nine games last year in his first full season, but I think everyone knows that uh, they, they, have, they, have to, they have to get better and become more of a contender in the SEC Western Division. Uh, they haven't beat Alabama since 2011. It's almost like they're obsessed with Alabama and trying to beat uh, the Crimson Tide. And this is really, there's been a lack of buzz during the off season about LSU. A lot of times there's, there's you know, championship talk. This is the year they're going to beat Alabama. Uh, and there really hasn't been a lot of that talk. There's been a lot of angst, really, uh, especially after the spring. I don't think it was a super impressive spring out of LSU. But now they go out and get Joe Burrow, the graduate transfer uh, quarterback from Ohio State. So I'm, I'm anxious to see kind of the mood of Ed Ogeron, where he thinks his team is, and, and kind of, you know, that first day, what, what, what seems to be the prevailing opinion, but how good, you know, LSU can be. Uh, certainly Jimbo Fisher is going to make some uh, headlines because he got paid so much money to come to Texas A&M, but I, I, I still don't expect them uh, to be, you know, a huge factor in the West his first year. The other uh, storyline is going to be Dan Mullen. Uh, to me, you know, he's, he's replaced Jim McElwain. Uh, he's, a, you know, supposedly an offensive guru. He's got to improve, you know, their you know their productivity. His recruiting so far at Florida has been underwhelming, quite frankly. Because if you look at the twenty four seven Sports Composite, Florida is in the, the lower regions of the top twenty, into you know around thirtieth, and Mississippi State's in the top ten. So Joe Moorhead's making some headlines early, recruiting better than Dan Mullen did. But Dan Mullen, Ryan, I think we all know if Florida is not a contender in his first year, and I'm talking about this season in the SEC East. That seat can get hot quickly in Gainesville because they have high expectations. He could be king of the world for winning eight or nine games a year in Starkville, but if he does that at Florida, he's just going to he, he could end up on the hot seat within two years because Jim McElwain won two divisions. He just never won the SEC championship, and we saw what happened uh, in year three when uh, the, he and the administration didn't see eye to eye. Certainly, Coach McElwain, now the wide receivers coach uh, with the Michigan Wolverines and Jim Harbaugh, but. Dan Mullen, I mean, he certainly had a lot of success as an assistant with Urban Meyer, but uh, he's on a bigger stage at Florida. And there's been Cole Kublik has gone on record as saying he thought he'd win a national championship with the Gators. He's going to have to start off quickly because he's not going to get a honeymoon in Gainesville. But the schedule is very favorable for him. I mean, when you look at the Florida Gators schedule, and I work my way there, but we were talking about it last week. I mean, you can find double digit wins. You look at the real challenge. When you look at the Florida Gators, it is the largest outdoor cocktail party we talk about in Jacksonville against the, the dogs coming up in October uh, the 27th. But you look until then. I mean, I mean, here we go. Let's, let's play the win-loss game. You ready, Drew? Yeah, go ahead. Charleston Southern, that's a win. Kentucky win. at home, win. Win. Colorado State at home, win. Win. At Tennessee. I got to go with a win there because – I just don't think Jeremy Pruitt has the talent from 1 through 85 right now uh, to beat the Florida Gators. If they do, uh, Dan Mullen, uh, his honeymoon will officially be over if he cannot beat Jeremy Pruitt in his first game. All right, so we got at Mississippi State, going to return for Dan Mullen back to Starkville. Win or loss? Oh, man, that is tough. I'm going to go with a loss there. I think Mississippi State's going to be sky high playing against their former coach. I think Jim Moorhead. They have a lot of experience coming back on both sides of the ball, offensively and defensively. Certainly they're going to be uh, using different schemes than they have been, but I really think it'll be a great football game, but I think uh, that Mississippi State can get that win. All right, so we got LSU at home against the Gators uh, there. So so I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I, I think, Florida's going to be hosting LSU is what I was trying to say. It just didn't come out the right, right way. Right. I think I've think uh, I, I've got a Florida win in that game. I I think Florida, you know, both teams kind of have uncertainty at the quarterback position. You don't really know how good they're going to be. But I think Dan Mullen outcoaches Ed Ogeron to get that win. All right, then you got to go to you got to go to Nashville against Vanderbilt. That's a win, right? 
win, yes. All right, then you get two weeks to prepare for Georgia. I've got to go with UGA there. I certainly think uh, Kirby Smart right now has, you know, done a great job. Uh, You know, uh, certainly he almost won the national championship. uh, You know, nobody really is going to remember who finished second in five years. But certainly they came close to, you know, breaking through. He won the SEC championship, first Eastern Division team to do that since the Gators in 2008. Uh, I think it'll be a really good football game. It's a great rivalry, but I've got to go with Georgia there. All right, so we got Georgia, Florida, and then when we look at very winnable games, They've got Missouri for homecoming. That's a win, right? Mm-hmm. Win. And then South Carolina coming to Gainesville. That's a win, right? Yeah, but I think that's going to be a closer than people think. I really like the game talk. I think if Jake Bentley stays healthy, I think they're improving defensively. I think legitimately South Carolina could be a top three team in the East. I think they could, if they could win that game against Florida, they could finish second in the division. But uh, I really think right now that's a tough one, but I, I do think you have to favor Florida uh, in games. All right, let, let's finish up this pretty quick here. Idaho, uh, that's a win. And then at Florida State uh, with Willie Tackard and, and first-year head coach going up against first-year head coach Dan Mullen, probably right now, probably more talent. I mean, And you also got to look, Florida returns 10 starters on offense and nine yeah. on defense. That That's pretty solid group coming back. So a lot of experience coming back for the Gators. I'm not trying to make an argument for Dan Mullen – I just don't know if he's going to get that honeymoon season that everybody's kind of expecting. They're not. He's not going to get a honeymoon. He should win. You know, not he has a chance to win nine or ten games and be in a, maybe not a big six bowl, but uh, maybe right in that second tier uh, if he can't get into the college football playoff. But certainly, I think they have a chance to maybe have like a ten and two slate uh, with the Florida Gators, and uh, that would be huge for him. It's just going to come down to Felipe Frank. Uh, Dan Mullen's been a quarterback whisperer. I've always been impressed with his work at Mississippi State and their quarterbacks. Uh, we'll see what he can do at uh, Florida. Certainly that was Jim McElwain's undoing. He could never quite get the offense over the hump in Gainesville. But uh, I think if uh, Dan Mullen can do that, there'll be a huge factor in the East. But uh, Dan Mullen right now, to me, he, he and uh, Ed Ogeron at LSU, uh, and, and to, to a certain degree, Joe Moorhead at Mississippi State, because of uh, you know the way he's recruiting early and what he did with that offense at Penn State, I think those are all some uh, storylines to watch. Besides the fact that I think Alabama is going to be, in my opinion, the overwhelming favorite to win the SEC. No disrespect to Georgia, but I just really believe uh, with the Tua Tagovailoa at quarterback uh, that Alabama should be the favorite, and because they're going, it'll allow their defense to mature and come along. Because that's like we saw uh, the way, best way to talk about it is. The St. Louis Rams won the Super Bowl in 1999, right? They scored so many points that their defense was able to play with the lead a lot. And I think Alabama will be able to do that in 2018. Well, it, they also need to do that where they can they can build some depth. I mean, if you get in front, you kind of go to your second str- string and third string guys. It gives you a little chance there to to kind of uh, you know set back and build some quality reps. Drew, I've got to run to break. As you know, this business, uh, I, I got to run to break, man, but I always appreciate you. Thanks for spending a little extra minute with us uh, here in Tuscaloosa. We're talking a lot about Terrell Lewis news. I appreciate you. Let me invite people to connect with Drew DeArmond. A great way. If you want to stay up to date with the Crimson Tide, it's very simple. You go Drew D977 ESPN, Drew D977 ESPN, Drew DeArmond. I appreciate you. And I hope you have a great afternoon. Thanks for spending an extended amount of time here in T-Town with us. Absolutely, Ryan. I always enjoy being on. Appreciate the opportunity. Hey, thank you so much. We appreciate that. Let me remind you, it is Foster's Veterinarian Clinic with Dr. Jimmy Cadet, 205-247-PETS. 